Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk about distribution networks, uh, mainly theory, although I have at the end uh, some simulations that uh, uh, I'm sort of new and interesting. Uh, this is work that I've been doing with Stephen Lowe at Caltech uh, and some of his students and some people at Southern Cal Edison. Uh, I've got way too many slides. To, uh, and so the first part of this talk I basically talked about last year at this conference, so I'm going to go through it really fast uh, to get to the new stuff. So bear with me. Uh, so the idea here is that uh, increasing distributed resource adoption implies difficulty for control of the grid, uh, uh, especially if we don't have much storage, uh, or at least uh, efficient storage. And controlling this through the wholesale side just isn't, isn't enough. And so the idea is how, could we, how can we integrate distribution networks, the retail side, the homeowner, into uh, grid management, basically. Uh, this is a, just a silly picture to give you some idea. There's the distribution network. This is the house over here. It's got PV, may have PV, a uh, variety of things. And what we need to do is, uh, rather than just running control from the, basically the, the distribution grid controlling these devices, we need to get information back and forth between these two and sort of get a kind of interaction. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, com contrasting thing. So the way I uh, do this is probably a little more provocative than necessary, but uh, sort of engineers basically say, you know, let, us, let me control your house for you and uh, we'll be able to manage, you know, we'll, we'll, then we can manage the volatility and the control and stuff like that. Uh, it's implementable, it's easy, it's, it's doable, but it's certainly not optimal in any kind of efficiency sense. Uh, economists, on the other hand, say let there be markets. Uh, prices to devices is one possibility. Uh, this is optimal, but it, it, it's really not implementable. It's not feasible to do things this way. Markets don't work as fast as electricity does, basically. Uh, and I'm going to talk about a way that I think, I believe, is both implementable and optimal. Uh, it's going to be, I call it smart control. I don't think it's really smart. That's sort of a bad word, but I'll use it today. Uh, and so the, the outline, I'm going to talk some theory, and then I'm going to talk about simulations. I'm going to focus on Volvar control, sort of in five-minute increments. Uh, this, basically, what I'm talking about would apply at a lower level to frequency or a higher level uh, or a larger time scale if you wanted to, but I'm going to talk about this low level, uh, five minutes. And so the idea is on the, there's a distributed network, distribution network, they're going to be N minus one, N plus one buses, I equals zero is just the, the substation bus. Uh, these are Kirchhoff's laws, they're voltage limits. Uh, I, not, I don't have line limits in here. When we did this with SCE, they, they said, look, if we have capacity problems on the distribution side, we just build more lines, so don't worry about it right now. So I, I, I think that we have to kind of correct for that. We, it can be corrected for fairly easily. Let me get this uh, arrow out here. So that, that's kind of the, 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 the distribution side. There's also, so that's the network. Then the consumers uh, will have utility functions for uh, consumption. And by C, it throws, throughout most of this, you can think of C as the temperature in your house or something like that. It's sort of, uh, uh, if I'm talking about HVAC systems, it's a temperature in the house. If it's, uh, uh, it's a quality of your pool water, whatever, you, you know, how, how warm your pool water is, uh, et cetera. The p consumption requires power, and so this is going to be that the power you, you need to consume for a given temperature in your house is going to depend on the external temperature, which we'll use E, the voltage levels, and this P tilde, anything with a tilde on it's going to be uh, the PV. It's going to be, uh, it's a random, it's a random number because sun's out or sun's down, whatever. Uh, but your, your power needs are going to be the net power here. This ignores dynamics. F captures the sort of the thermal properties of your house, how fast it reacts, etc. cetera. Uh, and faced with, if, if faced with the real-time prices, whatever these prices would be, either regulated or real time, they're gonna, consumers are gonna maximize their utility minus the cost of power. That's a standard economic model of consumer behavior. And I'm gonna assume for now that reactive power is uh, uh, 
fixed or proportional to the real power. And it's, I'm not going to worry about it separately right now. Uh, we actually do in the simulations, we allow it to change, to be variable. Uh, so I'm going to take it economi my, the economist goal, which is to maximize consumer plus producer welfare, subject to all the laws of physics and economics that I want to lay on top of it. And I'm going to assume for now that there's only one producer on the network, the distribu distribution network operator. Think of this as the utility if you want to. It's whoever's running, who's ever sort of controlling the network. Uh, and I'm assuming there's no, gener there's no sort of massive wholesale generation on the network. There's just distributed generation. Uh, uh, it's going to be, uh, uh, I'm going to assume the distribution network operates just following the rules, whatever rules we give it. Uh, they're not maximizing profits or anything. So we, the question is, what, what rules should we want them to use? So the, 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 Volv the Volvar control problem then turns out if you, if you were kind of had all the information, you knew everything, you didn't have to worry about incentives or who was paying who and what, uh, works out to be uh, a, uh, we, you choose the, the, the temperatures in the houses, the power, power at the substation, that's the power coming into, it, into the distribution network, the power at each of the nodes, uh, et cetera, to maximize this uh, social utility subject to the constraints. That's, that's the straightforward social maximization problem that we'd want to solve if we could. Okay, three problems in solving this. It's computationally hard. Uh, there are non-convexities in, in, the, in, the, in the problem, so you have to worry about that. Uh, it's the time scale we're talking about is five minute intervals, uh, so it has to be done every five minutes. Uh, it's not even clear five minutes is enough, uh, or it, whether you want two minutes, and it's not even clear whether five minutes is even possible, the, the computation requirements. Secondly, and the last thing is there's time correlation, which means that you, 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 if you, if you want to, sh you can shift things uh, in time, uh, and so we, these, the, you can't just compute this in terms of five minutes, you have to kind of do some look ahead planning. Information, the, distribu the distribution network operator doesn't know the utility functions, so they can't, they, they wouldn't even be able to solve this. And in, there's incentive compatibility, which is how can you, you know, do this in a way that the consumers would be agree to go along with you. I mean, they, they're going to sit there, uh, get, you have to get them to do things. Okay, so let's look quickly. The engineer's solution, let me control everything. So we give the distributed operator, the distribution network operator, access to the devices. This is Sean's favorite solution. It's just let me get in there and run it for you. Uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna, I've had arguments with, with all sorts of people about what this next line is, and maybe I can get some more ideas from you guys. But so if the engineer, if you gave the engineer this problem and said, do what you want to do, what would you maximize? And what we're gonna, we're gonna assume that you're gonna minimize what you're trying to try to minimize is a weighted average of both the cost of the power, how much power you're buying from the ISO to get load volatility, peak power, and line loading. Some combination, some weighted average of that. Subject to Kirchhoff's laws, et cetera. Okay, and that, that, so that's, that's what I'm gonna assume the engineer, that, that looks something like this. Let's not worry too much about the, I, I, I've tried to strip most of the math out of here just to get, get through here. Uh, the problem is it's not optimal. It, it does completely ignore the consumer's preferences. Uh, it, uh, it, it, it doesn't really take advantage of the full range of possible consumer responses uh, in terms of uh, demand response. Computation is not easy, but I'm going to, for the rest of this talk, I'm going to assume stuff is computable so that we can concentrate on the economics of the situation. In the simulations, we had to deal with the, with the computational issues, uh, um, uh, and I'll show you how that looks when we get there. Uh, so the, the, the real question here is can, can, which I, you know, sort of, if we get the economics right, maybe that'll help the computation too. So the economist solution is let there be markets, and we set up a five minute market for power at each node. So we have, we have n plus one markets and uh, operating every five minutes. Uh, and given prices, consumers maximize utility, and given prices, the, the distributed operator uh, maximizes net receipts from prices, from power, and then you set prices so demand equals supply, and 
voila, everything happens magically. It's not ever said exactly who sets the prices. That just sort of happens, uh, you know, uh, by, by magic. And the problem is that there are two things. One is that if, if voltage is actually, if voltage control is actually part of the problem, this doesn't really work and, uh, so you, you, it, because of the, for different reasons. But even if, you, even if you fixed voltage and just kept it at a fixed level, the markets don't equilibrate instantly. Uh, it, this, it, it requires simultaneous solution, but nobody has the information enabled to solve that problem. And so you have to do iteration, but if you iterate, it takes time to do the computation and you run out of time. So you get a temporary solution if you're not in equilibrium, you don't even have a feasible solution. So you've got, you've got, an you've got sort of, you don't have an answer. It's just not possible. Other market-like options bidding into the wholesale market priority pricing. Prices to devices uh, is, is sort of the, the, the sort of the proposed alternative to what I just described. Uh, I, I did talk about it last year. It turns out that it is optimal if you if so the way this might work is given whatever the, cons, the, the customers are doing the distributed network operator minimizes the cost of power required for the network that's easy to write out and the power demand that power demand generates a, substa a substation uh, LMP from the ISO and that determines a local LMP for each consumer okay and then they send they send that to the consumer and the consumer takes that price they choose their consumption to maximize their utility minus the cost of power and in equilibrium this will solve the problem the difficulty is that it's not it's really unlikely to be stable and I've got some little math it's really simple it's basically a cobweb for the economists it's the cobweb sort of problem the more and the the, 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 the instability is more likely the more consumers are, are the more consumers are involved in this the more responsive the consumers are to the prices and the closer to capacity that the ISO is because the, the, that gives you a steep, steep supply curve. These, so th at some level the question is you want consumers to be responsive to help you out in the network but if they're too responsive you got a problem with this policy and so it, uh, it's, a, it's a very risky policy. So the argument to here and I, as I say I went through this pretty fast and I have a lot of stuff behind it but basically argument at this point is that the economist solution is efficient but it can't be implemented the engineer solution is implementable but it's not very efficient so the question is can we find something in the middle that, it, that integrates the two and that's what I'm going to talk about next and I call it smart control but I you know that, that's that that uh, whatever so here's the, pr the proposal is as follows, and this is a very theor theoretical proposal, which is basically the, the, the consumer reports their utility function to the distrib distribution network operator. Now we'll see what that means in a little while. But principle, you report the DNO solves this, op th this is a, the old optimal Volvar control problem using that utility function. Yeah, that, that, you know, every five minutes we just crank it out. Okay? And so the, you know, the, the, the distributed network operator solves some first order conditions that, that generates a price uh, which they, the consumer is going to end up paying this at that price. So they report their utility function. The, the DNO picks the consumption, essentially sets your thermostat at whatever set point the problem says he should set it at. And then you're going to pay this uh, at this local, using at the Lagrangian multiplier basically. Okay. And if, it's if this story I just told you is compatible with communication limitations, with incentives and computation limits, then we will get the optimal solution. So if the, if the consumers report their true utility and it's solvable and everybody can, and it all works, everything's great, right? Uh, what are the issues? Well, the first one is communication. Could, will the consumer be able to describe their utility function? And most of us can't. I mean, I, I don't know what my utility function for, for the temperature in my house is. That's a pr pretty much a problem. Incentives, will I report the, even if I could, would I report the correct one? And then finally, given these, all these new utility functions in this computational problem, I've just made it even harder than it was originally. And so the, we may not even be able to solve it. So I've got to answer those three questions at least. So let's talk about describing utility function. 
Well, if we consider a, 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 a local Taylor series approximation, this quadratic approximation of utility function around their ideal setting. The ideal setting is what they would choose to consume if they didn't have to pay for power. So this is where you'd set your thermostat at in your house if power were free. Okay? And we, 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 we approximate the utility function around there and basically uh, it, we don't have to worry, I don't have to worry much about the constant term. The, the consumer really only needs to report two numbers to describe this utility function. One is its ideal setting point and it's uh, the second derivative. So these just two numbers are required to be reported. Okay? And uh, so now a thermostat records a set point and reports a temperature. Here, here it's also going to report a strength of preference. Think about it as strength of preference. So if I, if I, if I really, really, really want to, my ideal temperature and I'm willing to pay anything to get that, that's going to be, you, this use, this, this second derivative is going to be a large number. If I, marry, if I really want to minimize my payments, it's going to be zero. So it's a kind of a strength. So this is just, this is today's thermostat. Uh, tomorrow we just add a separate panel on it. So I have a strength of preference number that I set here. And, whoops, <laughs> what I do? And then over here, you know, it can just report sort of what's going on. So I can, if I don't, if I'm paying too much, I can, I can ramp up, I can lower the strength of preference and cut my bills. Uh, I'll, I'll, my set, my, uh, my ideal set point is here. My temp, my actual setting is going to be determined by how, how strong my preferences are and what the current prices are. It's a fairly simple idea, actually. Uh, will they report their true utility function? That is, will they re actually report what they want? Well, the DNO, first order, can, this is just a, 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 a sort of first order conditions for the DNO are going to solve using the, the reported utility function. Consumer wants the DNO to solve this because that's their first order conditions for their, their, op, their given what they're paying. And so if, you, if, you, if the consumer believes they can't affect their local price, say if there's no kind of <coughs> monopoly, con, sort of monopoly control within the distribution network, and if there, for example, if there are no, if there are no line constraints, then the distribution, their price is going to be the uh, local margin LMP price from the ISO, so they've got really very little control over that, then they're going to want to report the true utility function. So the answer is subject to some local network problems, the, 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 you'd, want to get, you'd want to give the utility company the right information. What about solving the optimal problem? Well, using a quadratic approximation, the, uh, you know, basically you're adding terms like this to the objective function, and we've already got quadratic terms in there anyway, so this doesn't really add, make anything more complicated. First order conditions are all linear, and so it really is no harder than the control only problem. Okay, so computational. All right? So, we thought we, we, part of the project with Southern Cal Edison was to simulate a particular distribution network, actually a, a real one. We have where will one? I'll, I'll talk a little bit about. It. I'll talk a little bit about the methodology we used in the simulation, and I'll give you some results. I ca uh, I'll caution you as I go through the results; they're very preliminary. We've just started cranking them out, so that it's uh, subject to change. But here's what we did. Uh, and the idea is partly to just see what, what would these kinds of pricing things do? What would, how would it affect things? So we have a, what we call a Southern Cal Edison Rossi circuit there. 1,400 houses, 130 commercial, industrial, mostly retail kind of uh, uh, building sort of things. There's 422 transformers. Okay, you can see the peak load is about six megawatts. And what we wanted to do was run simulation study. We have data for 2012, and so we're going to have we're going to run some simulations to kind. Of, we, we don't have data on everything, so we don't have, for example, internal house temperatures. We don't have. There's a lot of stuff we don't have uh, that we have to kind of guess at. And we so we run some simulations to to see whether we're close to 2012, and we are pretty much. And then we talk about 2016, and then we ask, what if we had 30 percent PV penetration? Uh, and some EV penetration, okay? And we run, a, a, we run a, well, I'll, I'll talk to you. So 
so the adoption, we, we have a model that was built at Caltech by the engineers, uh, an adoption model of PV, uh, which is, uh, uh, and, and sort of you can, it, the, and so we use that to indicate, to predict sort of what the PV adoption would be. And right in 2012, we had 16 of the units had PV, seven had electric vehicles, and three had both. Uh, the, the, in 2016, we predict an increase of, of this much. And then with 30%, that puts you up here, uh, a fairly sizable penetration. What are we going to assume? We're going to assume that we have the following devices are controllable. The HVAC system through the thermostat set point, a plug-in electric vehicle we can time subject to the constraint that so much, uh, uh, so much, uh, 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 we need enough power to be plugged, pump, pumped into it over a period of, of a fixed period of time. Pool pumps, inverters for the PV systems, and we're going to adjust the control every five minutes. And we have data, on, we have data for this. The, the voltage dependent loads uh, are, are the HVAC and the pool pump, and, our, and there's a base load that's in there. We get almost all our parameters for everything that's going on in these houses from a Grid Lab D uh, simulation. Uh, there's some problems with Grid Lab D that we, 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 we're not sure about yet. Uh, but it, uh, uh, the, we, 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 we look at comprehensive sort of voltage reduction kind of programs as part of what we're doing. And the voltage tolerance we're going to set is five plus or minus 5% of nominal. That's the limits, the voltage limits we're going to put in place. Uh, power loss on Rossi is very small, according to Southern Cal Edison. Uh, that means that we can use a kind of linearized branch model for, for, for the computation to replace Kirchhoff's laws. Uh, it's not a v DC model. It doesn't assume constant voltage, but and it's unbalanced. But it is. But it's a linear model as opposed to a nonlinear model of the uh, of of the of the power. Okay. So how do what do we do? This is our methodology. I'll walk you through it quickly. Uh, we start out with a, 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 an adoption model for distributed uh, resources and the model of the network. We get the network model from, from Southern Cal Edison. We have an explicit description of the network, so we know all that uh, from Southern Cal Edison. We take some data, we, 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 we plug that into the Grid Lab D model. We use the model, as I mentioned, the California, the Caltech adoption model, using, but we use SE customer data that they have uh, to, that tells us something about their rate structure and how much they're paying and everything. The adoption model is very sensitive, it's basically based on cost saving. Uh, and, uh, uh, so, and then EV adoption uh, data and arrival charge, these, these are, again, uh, predicted is, that's a, I don't think we have a very good model for EV adoption, but we, we put a, plugged it in there. Uh, we use the local M SE local the, the localized min marginal cost marginal prices for the Rossi circuit. So we have the price, the entire price history for 2012, uh, basically every five minutes uh, for what the what the price was that that Cal ISO was charging them at that circuit. Uh, we have public data on solar irradiance, and we have centrally recorded weather data. So we have all that to plug into our PV models. Okay. Uh, so the, then we plug all this into a database. We basically took stuff from GitLab D and plugged it into a Mat uh, MySQL database uh, because GridLab D doesn't compute things very fast, and it's not clear what's inside there for us. We, but there's some we did. so we took it all out, converted it. Uh, these are some of the issues we have. I don't, I don't know that I want to go over it right now. Uh, the, uh, uh, it, it's, whatever, let me go, let me go on. So the, the next step is we have to get user behavior. So we have to estimate utility functions and, uh, you know, things like that. We have to, in order to do what, to talk about consumer gains and losses, we have to kind of figure out what their utility function. We're going to talk about demand response to prices. You need, you need the utility function. And so we have to do two things. We have to estimate the utility function. We also have to estimate the power requirements of that house or how much power they need if they want their temperature set at, at 70 degrees. 
and we have to we have to do this for 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 the pool pumps and the EV behavior as well. Okay, and it's partly you know we've got we've got stuff. I'm going to give you some reports, but it's kind of partially validated. It's not completely validated yet, so we have to be careful. So how do we get F? Well, start out assuming the voltage is constant. We can we can look at the grid lab D data output. It'll tell us given what the outside temperature was. It'll tell us what grid lab D says the set points were. Okay, to get that kind of power flow, and we get an estimate. We get a linear estimate for each house. There's an eye, there should be an I on each of these uh, that looks like this. If I took off this last term, it would be a simple equation. It would be just simply that it's your, your, your te internal temperature, if your external temperature is higher than your internal temperature, the, 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 the internal temperature will rise, except you put power in, that'll pull it down. Okay, so that's just a simple. This, the, and that certainly fits the data if we're not cycling, but when we're cycling, we get a lag term in the estimate for some reason. I'm not sure why. So I, I don't understand the physics of that yet. In the steady state, you get something that looks pretty simple. It's just linear. But with voltage, we have to add in voltage because we're going to worry about controlling voltage. And part of the, part of the gains we get is by being a better, better control of voltage uh, in the system, lower voltages. And uh, so this, this is, uh, we just multiply the action, the, sort of the power you get is multiplied by that. So we just add that term in, we get something that looks like this. And we estimate, so the, 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 the parameters, the A parameters are all identified individually by household. The alpha is just a constant across the whole system. It's one number for everybody. Okay. What about utility? So this is sort of the other thing we have to do. So we, what we're going to do is we're going to approximate, we're going to do a quadratic approximation around the grid lab D set points, around the actual set points that we have for the consumers. Given the F and given the regulated price, consumers are going to, uh, that's the approximation. And when they maximize their utility at the regulated price pi bar, you can do this. You can at least, you can get a quick estimate of what their marginal cost, uh, their marginal utility is at C star. That's pretty straightforward. What about the second derivative? Well, we took demand elasticity estimates from a paper by Reese and White. Uh, which used, uh, which is based on monthly demand data. This was a fairly extensive survey in California. It's, a, it's actually a very nice paper. Uh, they have a linear demand equation, something like this. And if we assume that, that prices are on a five minute time scale, prices are fairly constant. Uh, and then using the approximation, we get, we get that if, uh, that if we look at the second derivative of f with respect to c squared divided by a, that's what your that's what your, that's your that's your estimate of the utility function. Okay, so we get a we get an estimate of the each person's utility function this way. Okay, then what we do is given all that information now, we run some simulations. The baseline is basically just looking for a feasible solution. Uh, it says it's sort of we just do a, a forward backward sweep and get a feasible solution. The optimal scenario we do for both the engineer's problem and for the for the smart control problem, and we use a linearized, multi-phased, unbalanced uh, problem. It's a second order quadratic kind of uh, cone problem, and we use a two-stage optimization procedure because I guess uh, it wasn't. It was, there, the non-convexities were causing all sorts of trouble. So we first fix voltage and then optimize with respect to the power flows and consumptions. And then we optimize after that with respect to B. Uh, I, I'm going to report on things where we did both, but the, it took a long time to generate the results so that when we do it simultaneously. Okay, we use two, two different objective functions, the engineers and the smart control. And we generate out of this, out of this baseline, we generate the power flows, the costs and benefits, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we can, we crank out these results. And this is the strong caveat. First of all, these results assume, also, they assume away all sorts of frictions and everything. So this is, this, these are really upper bound numbers. And they're also preliminary. And I, I reserve the right to change them tomorrow if I, if I find out something's wrong. So I have to be careful. Uh, about this, but they, they're sort of instructive, I think, at least. 
So here's the change in the social payoff. The social payoff is the sum of the utilities of the consumers minus the cost of power coming into the network, so from the I Cal ISO, okay? This is, a, this is a July, this is a period of July. And so what we did was we take, we take the, the temperature data, the everything data we have from, from 2012, we use that same data in 2016 and 20 and 3030. The, the, uh, the, the, the green is the 30% uh, uh, orientation. And what, what we get here is that the difference between, this is the change is the difference between the, what we get when we optimize minus what we get with the baseline. So the baseline is just finding this feasible solution. Okay? And so we get sort of, this is obviously kind of peak sort of, sort of time here. We got peak period. And we get a savings here of about $800 for the network. This is the off-peak period. These, these, I, I squunched this down because I wanted to make sure you got the scale right. There's, there's very little savings over here uh, in these areas. You just get saved. The only time you get real savings is when you uh, have sort of a really peak, you know, price. L and P prices are way up, basically. <coughs> they seem big, mainly on peak days, and they increase, the savings do increase slightly as you get more distributed, resource, distributed energy resources. Okay. Here's, here's, a week, here's the total change across a week. That, that was each day. This is by day. This is the total in the week. And this splits it between, so DR is the response, is the, is the change in consumption. It's the change in your thermostat as, as the prices go up and down. CVR is the changes due to be getting better voltage control. So that's, that's and the, the, together the, there's this. As those colors aren't very good, but you can see here that the the the, the savings from the, the both uh, sort of everything the, the CVR savings sort of are constant across the period doesn't matter very much. It's the de demand response savings that causes uh, things to go up uh, to get to get more savings. The the per unit savings per unit per day savings. This is the order of of, of magnitude here. Uh, in the peak period, in this peak week, the average saving is 23 cents, 25 cents a day per customer. Uh, I'm not sure that's a lot. Uh, it doesn't seem to be a lot. Uh, and over here in off-peak, you're getting only five, six cents per day. That's, that's not per kilowatt hour, that's per day, you know, in your consumption. So it's not clear, you know, to me yet, that this is, uh, you know, the, the economics of, of, of sort of really finely tuned uh, uh, Volvar control are, 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 are coming out to be worth it. We'll have to see. The, the, what we don't measure here, and what I haven't put in the social payoff, is all the fixed cost savings. Uh, uh, and, and sort of the, the, these come in, these are sort of building more networks, uh, building, you know, adding more capacitors if you need to, whatever, things like that. And I, we don't have that in here, and I, the, the, we, we have sort of one way to get them in here is to actually put line, con, line limits, uh, thermal limits on the lines and, and things like that. And the other thing we don't measure is sort of savings and reduction in reserve requirements and things like that. These, these, these pieces are not in here yet. So they're, they're, presumably if you get this stuff under finer control, you can save some of these external uh, costs. Uh, the, uh, this is, uh, let's see, what have I got here? Um, it's, I just did that. This is the change in the energy cost versus the utility. So you can see that uh, peak utility is actually going down, off-peak utility that's, uh, is going down. The colors are different years. So what's really driving those gains is the savings in energy costs, the savings in you don't have to, you don't buy as much energy from the Cal ISO. Uh, you get you, you can uh, consumers are cutting back on their use of energy at the peak hours and things like that. The volatility, so we measured volatility and power. Volatility is a change. Basically, it's 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 the change from one five minute period to the next five minute period in the power we're buying from the Cal ISO. So it's and that we square that and add it up. These are percentage numbers. And it shows that the uh, volatility were actually going up. Uh, 
This is off-peak, so 16% of off-peak isn't that big a number. But we're still going up in the peak hours by some. We're, we're, we, we get uh, these, this, is the, this is the peak, uh, the maximum peak of the week. So the peak goes up. And I don't understand this because with pricing, we ought to be cutting back on the peak. And I, it's just, so I, this is one of those numbers I, don't, I haven't had a chance to look at yet. Uh, so the change isn't that significant even with 30% penetration here at, at the, at the, in the peak periods. Uh, the volatility goes up by a hell of a lot. And that's, that's, these are percentages now, so that's a, lot, that's a big number. And I'm not sure where that's coming from. So I, I really, that, that's got me confused, okay? So I think it's right that, that, that volatility will go up. And this is volatility of, of buying, what you're buying from CalISO, right? Uh, but I'm not sure, it, I'm, I don't think the orders of magnitude have got to be right here. Uh, and so the, the other thing is that if we get, uh, well, if we add in line constraints, that'll go down a lot uh, also. So what about engineers? That, that was all for the smart control approach. What about the engineer's approach, which was focusing, remember, on minimizing peak and volatility and forgetting about the consumer? And here we get the uh, volatility changes. You can see the vol if you do the engineer's problem, volatility goes way down. It's possible using this Volvar control to crank things down a lot. Okay, uh, even if you don't, you know. So, and the peak, you can get it down too. Again, uh, not as not it's not huge, but it's, it it goes down a fair amount. Okay. So that, that's, that's what happens with, if you solve the engineer's problem. The cost, of course, is you, you hit the consumer up really badly. Because you, you get rid of the peak and you get rid of the volatility by shutting their thermostat off on them. Right? You, you have, you're not paying attention to the utility function, you just shut it off. And you don't save much in energy costs, but you really save a lot in utility. I mean, you, lose a, you don't lose much in energy cost. you don't save much in energy say very little and you, you lose uh, you lose a lot of utility so that's the and then the peaks you, you know the, uh, the, the, the you get uh, uh, this is these are the off-peak numbers these are the peak numbers these are the off-peak numbers it's the same story okay uh, so again caution preliminary subject to review uh, but it's but it's been it, it, we've got we've got the machinery in place now. We just sort of just got it in place, so that's partly why we haven't had. I haven't really, I was I, I you know the last two slides were put together this morning at six o'clock as my grad student was sending me the numbers uh, over the internet. Uh, so, uh, but we have the machinery in place now to actually go in and do this uh, in real in a real on a real network in real time and. Uh, we're hoping eventually that we actually get a pilot project in place where we can actually measure, actually try some of this stuff and measure it. Uh, so let me recap, I'm going to close down, recap. Uh, increasing distributed resource, distributed energy resource requires integration, requires some, some management of the distribution network. It, it's just, you can't just let it sit there. Uh, the engineer solution uh, is implemented not efficient. The economist solution is efficient, not implementable. Smart control, I believe, something like smart control actually would work. It could be done. And you could have it so consumers could opt out if they don't like you, 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 that thing. But it, it sort of requires one more dial on the thermostat. The PV has to be metered separately. Southern Cal doesn't do that right now. It's all part of the same uh, meter. It all goes to the same meter. They, the, the operator had the distributed the network operator has to be able to read two numbers and set one number on the thermostat so they have to be able to that's that's the new that's the communication they have to do and they have to know this f so somehow we have to be able to get the thermal properties of your house into the distributed network al algorithm that's sort of a energy survey once you know and then if you don't change your if you, your ac and there's some, you know, th 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 I mean, we were able to do this uh, in the simulations. There are gains from doing this in the simulations. Uh, there's some, uh, absent the loss of peak, you know, the increase in peak, increase in volatility, that, you know, 
Uh, and I have some, I actually have some numbers for doing a, a weighted average of those two approaches too. Uh, but I, I didn't include them in the talk. Okay. I had a lot of help from a lot of people to doing this. Uh, it's pretty much mine up to the end of the theory, but then after that it's a whole bunch of folks doing a lot of different things. That's it. Um, it would seem that it's great to have this kind of hybrid, but what you would need is a set of maybe for these set points you could cluster them and, and offer a menu of contracts so that the engineer knows who <laughs> the engineer would you know, have sets of people that they could control and, and hopefully in that way minimize that cost. Yeah, I, 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 it's, 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 so if you have, so one of the things I wrestled with for a long time, I actually tried, was, was sort of menus of contracts for power, right? The problem is those have to also be contingent on temperature and everything like, on uh, external temperature. So that's a huge number of contracts you have to have. This you can write very simply a, a menu of contracts with, for, for temperature, for set point. And it, and it works pretty easily. That that'd be a substitute for reporting that 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 strength of preference. It's a different way of generating the utility function. Well, and it might be that just that when you yeah. visit with the customer and you negotiate, you kind of get a feel for their their intensity as well as their yeah. point, and then they get in the contract yeah. A, the other ones in B, yeah. C, and D. I mean, my, my, my sort of sense of this uh, way I tend to think about this is that as a customer. I, I, I don't know how to solve these damn optimization problems in my house. I mean, I don't have a clue what's going on. I don't even know what my utility function is. But when I'm in my house and, the, it's, and I'm too cold, I raise the, you know, I raise the thermostat. If, it's too, if I'm too warm, I lower it. I probably would have the same sort of ability to do sort of, uh, do I want to pay, if I'm faced with these real-time prices, uh, do I want to, do I want to, do I want to react to the price? Do I want to be price sensitive or not? And I could, I, you know, if I give my, if I give me a, a little thing, I can, a knob I can turn up or turn down, I can probably find pretty quickly where I'm happy and comfortable and just leave it there. It's the way I do my thermostat. Um, yeah. Previous? Yeah. Oops. Did I turn? Why isn't it working? Oh, that's not mine. <laughs> that's why it's not. Okay. <laughs> this one? I'm sorry, say again. That's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm happy. Yeah. I, I think it's an informed engineer solution, is how I think of it. You know, it's sort of informed by by, by sensible economics. Uh, but uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, I I uh, I I've, I've I've asked enough, but you know, it's hard to get an engineer to commit to what they're really doing or want if they could control everything. Yeah, no, I'm, and that's, uh, I'm not turning it on and off, I'm just adjusting the set point. I think that's really, you know, really crucial to getting, uh, to getting this uh, stably managed, because if you, you're cranking things on and off, you know, it's not very smart. And, and that's why, you, you know, if you, that's why I said earlier, you know, if you pay me 12 bucks a month and I'm working from my house and I know it's going to get to be 100 degrees some summer day, I'm, I don't want to give you the right to turn my air conditioning. I might, I might be willing to raise my thermostat a little bit, but I don't want you to turn it off. And especially if you consider commercial buildings, which come for about half the load, from the pressure is so large that you can actually pay yeah. a great deal with right. the yeah. effect. Yeah. So I think, I think that's right. I think that's, that's the key to this. Yeah, first, well, first, firstly, a comment that in, in Britain, um, we generally find it difficult to find value in customers talking to the network in present day systems because we don't have much in the way of being flexible loads. So it's really, really surprising that, that this, these simulations are coming out with 
uh, such low uh, yeah. things when yeah. you have really right. the uh, air conditioning. Yeah. The other, other question, the other issue we've found with, uh, with uh, communicating with customers by marginal cost pricing is that famously um, marginal prices in at, uh, wholesale level are very volatile. So yeah. Probably too volatile to uh, expose. Well, what, 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 kind, what kind of volatility, what, what kind of range of margin prices were you? Well, they're, they're sort of over a lot of the period. There's not much volatility, but there are days where they they go up. Uh, you know, they're 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 around twelve, ten, nine, something like that. And then, but there are days where they run up to 100, 200, 300 hours day of days, peak times where they, 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 it's it's and the vo there's vo there's some volatility, but it's uh, it's these peak run ups that are really kind of big big changes. The thing is that. Uh, you know, the, the question is, would you, would a consumer adopt, take this or would they want to stick with their regulated price? Well, presumably the answer is, I'd go here if my average electric bill was lower doing this. I mean, if I, you know, I, I, I don't give a damn about volatility if I can keep my set point where I want it. And I can, but I can get a lower if by, by giving, by some, by some very, if I'm willing to move my set point up, when peak when they, when it's three hundred dollars an hour, uh, a kilowatt uh, by two or three degrees, that's going to you know I may in the long run save myself some money. And you know the question is if I you know if I if it's a deal on average my energy bill is less, and if it's enough less that I'm willing I'm being compensated for the increase in temperature slightly at, at these peak times, then I should want to do it. Maybe I'm not saying that everybody in the world is going to instantly adopt it, but. Uh, and yeah, I mean, if if I had if I have to sit there and think about hold, standing holding my thermostat and watching the price come across a ticker tape and then raise or lower it as as the price comes in, yeah, I'm not going to want to do that. The question is, can I find a simple way to do this? And that's what I think we're we're talking about here. So this is way. I mean, you know, this is this is sort of. Uh, I'm not a marketer anyway, so I don't know how to do that. Um, yeah, I mean. I I'm going to respond as an economist. Yes. Um, because, okay, which economics are we talking about here? Because, <laughs> you know, if, if one actually is thinking about this, one you know, push you on transactions costs, yes. economics, behavioral economics. Yep. So, you know, pretty dumb economics starting off to start with utility functions. So, I, I think, I think. And, and so there's a sort of theoretical which economics is relevant when we talk about getting consumers to respond to electricity prices. And then there is plenty of empirical evidence. Um, you know, we have got competitive retail markets in Europe. Yes. And the fact is most people don't care about, you know, people only switch supplier for, in the UK, it has to be up towards 100 pounds saving on their annual bill. So that, you know, we already know that most people aren't interested in these sort of small cities. Yeah, no, I understand so that. So the uptake rates are going to be very, very low, unless something's different. You know, so you, so in, in a sense, you need to, you do need to explain yeah. what is the customer proposition, right. and is it absolutely large enough? Yeah. No, I agree with that. I mean, that's, that's sort of the 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 numbers were for me surprisingly low uh, from when we ran the simulations. That is. The uh, I, I expected sort of higher savings to, to come out, uh, and as I say, these are provisional at this point, you know. Uh, but the uh, uh, and I agree, you know. I mean, it, 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 there is sort of there are all sorts of behavioral issues here. But if, but if it's twenty, I mean, it could you, the customer proposition could be if it's twenty cents a day every day. Yeah. Well, you know, maybe, maybe it is fifty. Bucks a year. Yeah, it's a hundred bucks then, but it's not. But it's not twenty-five cents every day. It's only twenty-five cents at the peak, and so and, and the peak is a, not. You know, even if it's two months of peak, it's still not enough. That's not very much. It's six cents a day the rest of the time. That's that's just not a whole lot of money. To be, that's not a whole lot of savings, and that's that's the that's the combined. That's the, the energy savings minus the loss in utilities. I mean, it's adjusted for the utility loss. It's a basically a, 20, a six cents uh, in the offbeat period. That's just a real small number. But you could work at what, what would have to be, I mean, which 
permanent amount of shares yeah. before you hit yeah. 100 bucks a year. Yeah. Well, I mean, there are a number of things. I, I, we probably don't have much time, but there are a number of things going on here. I'm using the same in 20, under the 30% penetration, I'm using the same prices that I used in 2012. Because I didn't make any adjustment in the Cal ISO pricing structure moving out, assuming that if there's 30% penetration of solar and wind on the whole California network, that's going to change the, the pricing, that the local marginal cost prices are going to change. There's going to be more variation in those. There's going to be wider variation perhaps. And so you're going to, it's, that's going to change things. I mean, there's a whole number of things that are just not in here and that need to be there. Uh, and, uh, and as I say, we're using the LMP price. We're not include, we haven't included a surcharge for reserves or anything like that. Uh, that's, you know, add 20%, it's still not a big number. So. Uh, I don't, it's hard to know. But this is very preliminary, so I have to be very careful. But I agree with you that if it's not a big savings, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna waste my time. I mean, the cost of the meter is more than the damn savings, right? I mean, it, yeah, it, so you, you have to run this program for a number of years to even catch up to the, just the infrastructure you have to put in place to do it, because you need a whole communication infrastructure, too. I know there are many more questions, I have some. Go. Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay.